Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Well, Richard, how are you doing this afternoon? Good, Will. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to come on today. Do you mind giving us a brief bio and some of the big ideas you're interested in? Uh, sure. So the bio, I mean, it's a it's sort of boring. Actually, that is it's interesting. Wait, let, let me let me take that back because it's boring. The CV version is boring because I um, went to college. I went to law school at the University of Chicago. I went to college at the University of Colorado. I dropped out of high school. I have a GED. I went to law school at the University of Chicago. I got a PhD in political science at UCLA. Did a two year fellow and. Uh, uh, two-year fellowship. My focus was on international relations at uh, Columbia um, until about until um, 2020, actually. Uh, and then I started my uh, think tank uh, called the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology, which is interested in social science things like you know good data practice, replication crisis. But we've recently taken a focus. Uh, we've taken a uh, sort of a. a uh, moved in the direction of more progress studies, uh, how functioning of institutions, uh, public policy, things like that. And then um, at the same time, besides my big tank, I mean, I, I write my own things. I, I wrote a book called Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy on American uh, Foreign Policy. Um, I uh, have a sub stack. I write about uh, wokeness and the, the origins of wokeness. And I you know, argue it comes from civil rights law and it's deeply embedded in American law. And also I'm on, you know, I'm on, uh, Twitter and I'm on Substack, like I said, and I write about uh, still foreign policy and American politics mostly. That's about it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I- I'm going to go off the outline, off the outline, and so I apologize for this. But um, I- I'm curious. You've had a transformation from you know you worked in academia into kind of more of a public intellectual role. I, I would say, you know, how has that transition been? Is there been anything that was kind of surprising to you, like in interacting with the public more than like just with academics? You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's funny. So, I mean, my, I, I was, uh, I, pro- I thought, you know, the reason I went and uh, got a PhD after um, I got my JD was I, I, I was interested in the world of ideas. Um, and so I thought, you know, I want to write articles and books and explore important big questions. So I said, oh, I'll get a PhD in political science, right? No, no, that's, 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 not, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> oh, <no>. uh, so <laughs> this is a theme too, from people that have a PhD on the podcast. Like I've heard this several times. So yeah. anyway. Uh, so, you know, I did that and then I, you know, the, I had the uh, Columbia fellowship. I was sort of, I had my, you know, one foot off the door. I thought maybe somebody would hire me at a think tank. So my background was in foreign policy. Gotcha. Um, I did actually work for uh, defense priorities for a while, nice. um, which is, uh, you know, most foreign policy think tanks are interventionists and I was more uh, anti-interventionist on American foreign policy. So they really, the real choices were like, you know, Cato defense priorities, a few places like that. There's, there's more than there used to be, uh, but I thought maybe I would do that. So I started dipping my toe. I, Started doing stuff for defense priorities. I did a report for Cato. Um, I uh, I dipped my toes in the water. I started tweeting a little bit, still being careful, still trying to you know uh, uh, keep my options open. Um, I started writing things on my Substack, and then they took off like you know beyond. Um, and they were not even not in my, not in my uh, direct on um, my area of so-called expertise, foreign policy, uh, but on American politics. So I had a few Substacks that really really went viral. Uh, my Twitter started taking off, um, and I said, "Okay, I'm I'm, I'm good at this. This works. Um, I don't really I don't need I don't even need you know I don't need academia. I don't even need the think tank crowd. I I don't really." need institutions at all. Um, I could say whatever I want. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who will appreciate it. Um, and yeah, it hasn't been, hasn't been that long. That was, that was really late 2020. That's awesome. And now I'm here in early 2022. I love that. I love that. Um, so, so you've kind of exited, you know, institutions and you went to create your own, you know, the center for, um, uh, excuse me, uh, for partisanship, focusing on partisanship, but also progress studies as well, making governance more effective. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what do kind of academics, what, what do people know that read the literature about partisanship that, you know, lay people would just find surprising or like counterintuitive? Yeah. I mean, counterintuitive, I, I, it's hard for me. I mean, I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm on Twitter a lot and I'm talking to people, <laughs> reading people who know a lot about politics. I, I don't know like how normal people think about politics now, but I, I think the understanding, but I, I, I suspect sort of that there's not 
tons that's counterintuitive now because gotcha. I think the uh, sort of the political science view has filtered down. Like I think like five years ago, uh, six, seven years ago, when Trump came on the scene, um, there was a lot of economic-based explanations of Trumpism. It was like these people lost their jobs. Oh, if you just, you know, uh, raise the minimum wage, um, you know, they, this they would have Trump, you know, whatever. People were right. people had these sort of uh, you, you like sort of um, you know, they're mar- they're not Marxist explanation. They're kind of Marxist. They're, they're they're based on the idea that there's you know, uh, there's like false consciousness and people right, just following right. their economic motives and maybe they're able to be fooled. But basically, that's what's going on. Yeah. This materialist conception of uh, how voters behave. I you know even but that wasn't just the public. That was like you know, that was the elites. Um, that was a lot of people. You'd see normal things like that. And I think, you know, the conversation has gotten smarter. I mean, I, that people don't say that much uh, that that anymore. I mean, we have a lot of data showing that economics, I mean, political science knew this in the like 1970s and 80s, that economic circumstances are not a very good predictor of your politics. Um and, uh, you know, Brian Kaplan, who many of your readers are familiar with, wrote a, uh, uh, talks about this uh, false self-interested voter hypothesis, wrote a book called The Myth of the Rational Voter. Um, so, you know, p- smart people, smart people knew this. Um, but, you know, a lot of other smart people, you know, people in journalism or people who are political pundits uh, uh, didn't. And they, and they seem to actually know that now. Um, so I think that we're getting a more accurate understanding of uh, sort of partisanship and quote unquote ideology. You know, what people would be surprised by. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it really, de- I, I, I need data on like what people actually think. All I know is what like academics think and I know what journalists think. And I say, you know, I look at data, so I, I know what people people think. Um, but, not, you know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a testament to the state of our discourse that it's not so obvious that there's things that people are getting wrong, at least on that. Yeah, that's very encouraging. Um, and do you have a sense on how much genetics matter for uh, people's, you know, ideologies? Like, is it generally something we're kind of born with? Maybe we have like some kind of farmer forager dynamic going on where, uh, you know, people have one preference one way or the other. And then maybe we're like molded on the margins to uh, yeah. one thing or the other. What's your thought yeah. on that? Yeah. So, I mean, when you do the, when you look at the behavioral genetic studies, I mean, it's basically, you know, it's the same lesson you get with all behavioral genetic studies, uh, which is that genetics matters a lot. Um, you know, it's like 50% of the variation or more depending on what you're measuring. Now the, the, the finding was that ideology that, you know, ideology followed that, um, that followed that pattern of, you know, it's like 50% or so genetic yeah. variation. And, and then, but, but then party identification, um, traditionally, this was the finding was more, uh, you know, correlated with a, a home environment. Uh. Um, but ideology and party are becoming much, much more strongly correlated over time in America. So there aren't lib- people who are liberals who call themselves Republicans and people who are conservative call them, and much more. So I, I, you know, I, it's, I think it's just all, it, it can be seen as more, you know, correlated within the home and genetics. It's all together. People's natural inclinations are putting them into one tribe or the other. Now, you know, it's like, it's, it's important to understand here that, you know, if you study pub- public opinion, it changes very quickly. So in 10, 20 years, it moves this, you know, Trump can say something or Obama can say something, uh, the, the Democratic, uh, you know, uh, Black Americans shift, had a huge shift on gay marriage um, in the aftermath of Obama uh, coming out in favor of gay marriage around 2013, 2014, around that time. Um, and so, you know, that can obviously be, that obviously cannot be genetic, um, but it is, it is picking something up, you know, so like, so like, you know, people can change that fast and they're that, they're that sort of malleable. Like why is, why are the uh, twin studies showing um, that, you know, uh, people's, you know, biology is making conservatives or liberals, you know, I, I suspect it's something along, it's something along the lines of there's physiological reactions that people have uh, to the parties. <laughs> You know, the, you know, I, I, this is one of those areas where we might have gone backwards in our scientific knowledge because, uh, uh, you know, the 120 years ago, you thought, you know, this this stuff, uh, this stuff gets dismissed as phrenology. Now you could look at someone's, you know, cranium and you could tell something about their personality, right? That, that right. You know, we, we're not supposed to not believe that. There's more recent studies that do show that. Ironically, I saw one study out of the University of Delaware that said you could look at a man's face and tell how racist he is. Like there was some correlate, and it's like the irony of this, which academia is like super, you know, anti-racist. Yes. But then, like they stereotype the biological features, but you know, I'm not saying that's not, that's not true. I, I think there is something to something to this kind of uh, uh, research. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the exact mechanisms, you know, are the, you know, it's, you know, the short answer is genetics, very important. And then the exact mechanisms are, you know, interesting and, you know, I think yet to be fully explored. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it, it sounds like it's, it's quite complicated. I, I, I'm curious, you know, this is kind of a, a left-hand turn a bit, but I, 
partisanship in the U.S., do you see like some pathway to de-escalation? Because to me, it just seems like it's just going to get crazier and crazier and crazier. There's there's nothing we're really going to be able to do about that. Yeah. So um, so how old are you, Will? I am 27. Okay. So I'm a little bit I'm a little bit older than you. I'm in my mid 30s. Uh, it actually matters a lot because I can remember a lot, obviously that that you don't remember, and people yeah. older, obviously can remember even more. And you know, I, I, there's now there's enough historical eras that I've lived through and. Um, also I read about historical eras and there's nothing like living through it. I mean, you see something that you yeah. don't get just from reading a book. So the nineties are much clearer to me than the eighties. I didn't, I, I was too young in the eighties, nineties, you know, I can, I can remember. Um, and you know, the, the you know, what, what, what strikes me is that is like, you know, you watch like the late show now, or you watch like a pro athlete go out and pop, like, you know, like it's just, they're liberal. I mean, it's just very fascinating. Yes, right? absolutely. And like, you know, it's weird to think back at a time where like sports stars, like didn't speak about politics actors, you know, did, but much, much less. It wasn't the center of, you know, the Grammys or, or whatever. I was talking to somebody from Korea uh, who told me that I'm like, Oh, do that. Are actors like unsufferable, like, you know, scolds in Korea. I was like, no, if they tried to talk about politics, people would be like, why is this actor talking about politics? Like well, well, why, you know, <laughs> what, what they know. And you know, this is, this is, this was probably America with, you know, athletes where they we were at with athletes in the 1990s. Although we always had, we always had a tradition of actors, uh, you know, speaking up, going back to like the 60s right at least maybe before that um and so i guess the point is you know y- you know politics in, you know i'm old enough to remember politics and even you i mean you could remember 10 15 years ago you know it's been yeah. more extreme time but politics was less central um to the culture yes um and you know so so i guess to ask you know if you ask how do we get off this uh, you know escalatory ladder how, the question is you know um, how we got here, and I think social media. You know, it's a it's a it's a conventional story, but I, I think there's something there's something to that. Um, I think there's actually a different, uh, also another story, um, which is that uh, the access to information, uh, basically, um, you know, because a lot of ways, you know, the the voters are becoming better informed because. If you were a liberal who voted for George W. Bush over Gore in 2000, uh, you, there was something you didn't know. I mean, you were you were not acting like you were not acting in a way that was internally consistent. Same with all the people right. who were there were a lot of people who were Democrats who you pulled them on their social views or their views on immigration um, 20 years ago. You know, you're like you know they have nothing in common with the elites of the Democratic Party. Uh, so people are actually sort of you know I think they're becoming better informed. There's uh, policy entrepreneurs who are going out there and be like, you're a Democrat. Well, they believe X, Y, and Z, and people like. Oh, my God, you know, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe in X, Y, and Z, you know, right. I'll, I'll go, I'll go to join the Republicans. So, it, you know, part of it is like the story is like social media, different part, part of it is like, we're better informed and we have much less in common than we thought. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's, the, there's like a dark sort of story. There's like a dark story here where it's like, oh, the things you supposedly want an informed citizenry that like cares about politics, like gets you people hating each other. Um, and so, you know, I, that part is there. That part is still going to be there. Um, I think, you know, but but who knows? I mean, we're so, the, the social media, I mean, the technology is new and we're adjusting to it. And like, it's not just our politics, it's our society. So, uh, you know, like, you know, Twitter is like a thing for like Generation X. And then like, you know, I, I don't, you know, I or, you know, older millennials. And then like, you know, there's a uh, TikTok, which I think people my age don't, don't really use that much. And then the people that are younger, they're all on it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to see where this is going to go. I think it's very, you know, it's harder to predict it, maybe, maybe more than ever. Uh, TikTok doesn't seem as conducive to like political polarization and, and stuff than Twitter. I mean, the people who do like the TikTok, I mean, they just look ridiculous and it has a whole frivolous feel to the whole thing where like the, you know, I guess the 280 characters is like perfect for like F you, you racist or something like right. that. And TikTok is like, well, if you made a video like that, who wants to watch that? They want to watch yes. Joe's dancing, right? Yes. Uh, so maybe we'll move to, you know, well, maybe we'll move to a place where, you know, we're not as political, but you know, that's just TikTok. Like who knows what, what social media people be using, you know, 10, 20 years right. down the line. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I, I really like the social media story. I, I'm curious, do you think any of it has to do with um, with growth, with lower growth? You know, if there's lower economic growth, you know, it's harder to do horse trading in a democracy and it's harder to split up the pie in ways where everyone wins. And so the battles become like more, more difficult, more vivid because, you know, you will have a winner and a loser. It's more zero sum. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, so this was a uh, Chris Caldwell argued that for this in, uh, in his book. I, you know, I don't really buy it. I think you know, as far as if you look at government as sort of splitting money to people, I mean, government, yeah. I, it's not getting smaller. I mean, it's, it's you know, as big as as big as or bigger than ever. And uh, no, I reject. I mean, I reject the the sort of the uh, the economic you know 
connection there. I mean, you look at like something like you know Eastern Europe, uh, for yeah. example. Very uh, strong economic growth, uh, very sort of sharp right turn in their uh, in their <laughs> politics. Um, so no, that there's something. I mean, there is some, you know, there there is some, you know, there is something going on with the economy, right? It, you know, it's it, it, you know, there, there, it's like ec- the economy is such a broad thing that, like, for say, <laughs> economics does not involve, in fact, politics. Like that, that can't be right. Um, but like these stories were like, you know, things are bad. So they so people are less happy. So they fight. I, I don't see a lot of direct evidence for that model of the world. Um, gotcha. You know, economic that even our uh, during the Trump era, I mean, the, the economy for the lower classes was actually a uh, pretty good. Um, and you know, we hated each other as much as ever. So yeah, right. I, you know, I, I, you know, I focus more on the uh, in the immediate path past the you know the social media and the means of communication rather than the objective economic factors. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, and, and talking about governments, um, you know, are there any quick wins to make like the American government more efficient? I was at Oak Ridge recently, uh, you know, where they did a lot of the Manhattan Project work, and I was just struck by the fact that the the same organization that built the first bomb in four years is now the Department of Energy, which is like yeah. just completely ineffective. Like, are there any like quick wins to like try and like fix some of these things, or is it just like a really slow grind to try and reform these institutions, or is that even possible? Yeah, I think you're, I mean, I think you're in a better, uh, you know, you're probably, you probably know more about this than, than I do. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing, I mean, one, you know, there's, you know, what can, what can you do to make, go, I mean, it depends on, it depends on sort of what your goals are, right? I mean, the, the easiest way to do stuff is sort of, if you want to, you know, if, if uh, I was going to advise like, you know, effective altruist people, and which I'm sure yeah. many among your audience, I'd, I'd say, you know, there's, there's nine people on the Supreme Court, you need five of them. I mean, probably focusing your, pro- like doing deep psychological dive into like what motivates these people and what their sources of information are would probably be the best way to get quick fixes to make the government better. Um, you know, people do like, you know, Supreme Court lawyers do this, like in their arguments, they say, oh, I want to appeal to the swing vote. But, you know, uh, I think, you know, a, a, like a propaganda campaign that's going right. to uh, get at a, you know, Justice Kavanaugh or Roberts or something, I think is probably like a good way to influence our politics uh, in a certain direction. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's just hard. It's just such a, it's such a broad question. It's hard to say. I mean, there was Cass Sunstein during the Obama administration. He tried to introduce um, cost benefit analysis into, uh, um, you know, into government programs and regulations. Like, and like you think like, wait, what were they doing? They were not doing cost benefit before they were just doing stuff. Right. <laughs> just saying, doing like, stuff. who knows? Like, we're not checking if it makes sense <laughs> or, or it doesn't. And I, I don't think that actually went anywhere. But, you know, if that was possible, you know, that'd be great. The problem is nobody does that. And they haven't done cost benefit analysis ever because there's apparently not an incentive to do so. Uh, so how you fix that, you know, I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, going off this, you know, we failed to build a functioning state in Afghanistan. You know, was there any, do we have any chance to begin with? It, was there a path to success there? Or was it just like a fool's errand all, all along? I mean, there, you know, I, I think, you know, it depends on what the, the sacrifices you're, you're willing to make. I mean, the question is, was it, you know, we have, you know, we could, we could, I mean, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying I advocate this and I would never advocate this. We could have killed every single person in Afghanistan. If we wanted to use enough coercion, yeah. we could have got them to do, you know, what we wanted. Um, right. And we have, you know, we could have had a draft and, you know, alternative what we were wanted to sacrifice the Afghan lives. We're going to send millions and millions of Americans to go and fight, right. for, fight for the Afghanistan government. Uh, the, you know, the question is, could we have done it given, you know, are sort of within the range of like what our human rights norms are and our values and like what the country was willing to sacrifice. Um, and I'm of the, uh, of the opinion that no, I mean, uh, you know, and the other, you know, the other thing, you know, the other thing, the other thing that we absolutely like could not compromise on was we wanted it to be a democracy. Now you can maybe do stability. It's hard enough. It's hard enough to, you know, just do stability, uh, yeah. to do democracy. And, you know, the kinds that you get to the minutia of what the U.S. was doing. I mean, like sexual harassment training for like Afghan police officers. I mean, it's like, it's like a, you don't even have like control of like the streets. Like, it, it's amazing. Like, right. it's just the thing that like, you know, they care about here that are sort of the cultural stuff they were doing over there. Um, and, you know, if they didn't do that stuff and they just focused on the war effort, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know. But, um, 
no, it was it was hard. I mean, look, the, the 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 entire you know we like to pretend like the, there's a process of state building that is uh, uh, that we have insight to, and we just have like best practices, and we have bullet points, and you know we can give these people a state. You look at these you know these things, the, the counterinsurgency uh, doctrines, they're ridiculous. Oh, you have to talk to the villagers, and then you have to like show you understand them, and show cultural respect, and then provide a well. And it's like it's like right. maybe that'll lead to a state. But you know, there's a a good bit, uh, a good um, there was a show called uh i forget what it was but there was like gopro cameras on american soldiers in uh afghanistan so it's it, it's called uh, under fire taking fire something like that it was a tv show you could buy it off youtube for like a dollar or two an episode and they would go and they're like you know they're, they're, the soldiers are driving or you could read about this but it's, it's different to see the video and, and they're like you know let's build a girl's school and so like they're going to build the girl's school and like you know, it's just nothing. It's just like a mud in the middle of the, and they're taking like a bunch of stones and putting them on top. Like, okay, I guess that's part of her mission. And like, they're getting fired on, on the way there. And if I, <laughs> I'm like, okay, once the school is built, are you going to get the textbooks? Like, are, are you going to do enroll? Like, w- w- what's the plan here? Like if this building gets built, which you're being fired at while you're trying to do it. I mean, you know, you feel sorry for these soldiers, but you know, this is, this is, these are the orders that they're, that they're getting. Um, and, and if you do build a school and the textbooks and you have a functioning administration and a sexual harassment policy, like, did you win the war? <laughs> like, no, like what, what, what is going on? <laughs> it's so, it's just so insane of what we were doing there. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the short answer is, uh, you know, I really, I really doubt it. It's mysterious. The Taliban, you know, whatever he said about them, they had the ability to motivate men with guns to go and control land and keep order. Yeah. They did that before the U.S. was there. They did that amazingly while the U.S. while fighting the U.S. They did that in regions of the country, um, and now they've done it. You know, afterwards, whatever they had, God is on their side. They would say, or, or whatever it is, they have a you yeah. know a story. They they call it Abbasia. You know, this uh, this old uh, Arabic term. Um, you know, whatever it is, they had it and. Or whatever we, we had no idea how to transfer that to a government that looked like ours we just didn't know how to do that right right well and but my big question i guess is it's like why are we just like so, like so unable to do that if we've got you know we've got the smartest people in the world best universities yada 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 you name it smart people in the state department they're just like completely unable to make like what are like elementary errors it seems like anyone could tell you this is a bad idea is it just like a problem of incentives all the way down yeah, I think so. You know, I think that the military has a lot of prestige. I think the military, you know, they they have a sort of a a culture that, you know, I mean, they're good at like certain things and they're, you know, they, uh, logistics and things like that. But, you know, they have a very can-do attitude, um, you know, that they have optimism. They don't, they're selected, I think, on that basis, you know, sort of a political basis. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, getting to my book, I mean, there's a lot of uh, funding of think tanks of people who have a certain kind of bias uh, towards American action abroad. And then you have these powerful, and like, you know, we, we have no like real skin in the game in Afghanistan. I mean, we're like, you know, soldiers sacrifice and we spend a lot of money there. But in the end, it doesn't matter what happens to the U, you know, for the sake of the U.S. And they try to convince you Got that it. it does. You know, uh, it's a haven for terrorism. Blah blah. Okay, we've we've been gone for a while. Like, hey, how many Americans yeah. have died of terrorism? Yeah. How, like, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter objectively. Um, and so, you know, we were never going to care that much. And so, what do we do? We fall into bureaucratic habits. Okay, you know, build a sexual harassment, you know, uh, handbook. That that's just what we're used to doing. You know, call for uh, uh, you know ethnic inclusion. Uh, you know, have democracy, run elections. You know, it doesn't correspond to anything that's happening on the ground. I mean, the parliament, I mean, it's just like these war drug dealers and warlords just like sitting there and like, you know, uh, you know, just be like looting, you know, the foreign aid. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, we, we just, we, you know, we just did the bureaucratic thing. So it was definitely, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, just demonstration of some pathologies in the system. It, it's, 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 you know, the Afghanistan war was like so interesting because it was just such an extreme example of like, where the political mission and like the means to achieve that uh, political mission and like the reality were just so dis- uh, you know there was such discrepancy there right um and then we uh and then you could look back and you could look at all these reports and you could look at the Afghanistan papers. I had a thread. I reviewed a book on the uh, uh, Afghanistan papers by Craig Whitlock for Reason magazine uh, you know several months ago. Um, but you know it's the same people, you know it's the same system and all the foreign policy. So you know I suspect you know we probably don't know what we're doing in a lot of places. Right, right. Well, I, what can we do to make foreign policy better? Is it just like uh, intervene less? Is that just the answer? It's like just try and do less on the margin. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're not. I mean, there's. You know, I think we're not. We're not good at it. I mean, and when I talk, when I talk to people uh, about this, you know, the, the you know smart people, you know, the, the, you know, the, the pushback I get, and this is maybe a common view. It's not just smart people, but the fact that smart people says say it makes me take it a little more seriously. It's you know, you need sort of you know a hegemon. You need like 
global order or if it's not the US, you know, it'll be uh, someone else. And, you know, I just, I just don't know the, you know, I don't know if that premise is, is correct. You know, the war has declined a lot. And there's two theories as to why, uh, you know, two, you know, grand, you know, theories you could yeah. say. One is America, you know, post 1945, America has been the hegemon and it's basically done a good job, you know, for all its flaws. And, you know, we haven't had a great power war and, you know, war is less, you know, common and, you know, despite the recent, you know, recent happenings. Um, you know, the other story is there's, you know, I guess every other theory is like something else happened rather than America. Obviously, a lot happened in 1945, right? The world, the world changed and, you know, nuclear weapons, obviously. Also, 1945. This is why the causal thing is, is so hard, right? 1945 is also, you know, 20 years later, you get 30 years later, you get the liberation of, of women in Western countries, right? And so it's like there's like you know 10 things that are plausibly you have TV, you have right, you have TV becomes a thing, right? So you have so many things that are going on in the world, um, and you know, and 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 you know, so there's that theory. And, you know, I think, you know, to me, I don't know, like the America did it is like, you know, Amer- it's thanks to American hegemony is like one theory. And then there's like 20 other plausible theories to me. And so like, you know, I guess if they're all equally plausible, it's like one in 20. Right. It's like America that's, that's kept the, uh, they've kept the peace. So it seems like, you know, 95% chance it's probably, probably don't need to be doing all this stuff. And then like, when you look at sort of the specifics of American foreign policy, um, uh, it's like, yeah, like, look at how many of the conflicts are just like, you know, America has been involved in. You could always say it's been worse, but like the Middle East went up in flames. Okay, we overthrew Iraq. They had a civil war. Like the Iraq civil war bleeds into Syria. We armed the opposition uh, uh, in Syria. Uh, you know, we, uh, Libya, I mean, we, we overthrew that government. They had a civil war for a decade after, you know, the uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't start the conflict in Yemen, but we know we supported the Saudis in there. Ukraine and Russia, I mean, people think that, oh, well, it vindicates like, you know, you needed to stand up to Russia. And it's like, no, the people like John Mersheimer who said, you know, it's not like John Mersheimer was in charge. The people, you know, who wanted a strong American presence in Eastern Europe have been in charge. So I don't know how they get to be in charge for, you know, the last 30 years and then say, well, you anti-interventionists, you guys, you guys got it wrong. It's like, no, you guys are the ones who are empowered and you let us here. Um, so, you know, for all these reasons, you know, I, I'm skeptical of uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the more militaristic parts of American foreign policy. And yeah, I would scale it back. Got it. Got it. And uh, how worried should we be about, about, you know, the near peer competitor, China at this point? Yeah. I mean, so people think, you know, they have, they try to find these, you know, and not just you know regular people, but like, you know, like uh, international relations scholar, they have these like, I was talking to somebody the other day, they have these like, uh, you know, sort of uh, your heuristic. So they say, do we want a unipolar world where like, you know, the US or do we want a bipolar world, China or multipolar world? And I, you know, I've, I've spoken like this too. And I, I you know, I think that sort of obscures more than it, you know, that it, uh, it, that it helps sort of understand things. So you can imagine many different kinds of worlds, right? So like, like, uh, you know, a unipolar world in the sense, like a government, like, you know, a monopoly of force, that's not going to happen. Right. So like, you can imagine that's the best system, but if people are thinking unipolar world, that's what they're imagining. Like it's the American government ruling over America. Uh, You're not going to get that right. Um, You know, other countries have nuclear weapons and armies and, you know, other things. Um, And so, you know, you're not going to get that. And, you know, so you're going to, so, you know, there's, there's at least two dimensions you're going to get. You can think of a world where like, you know, unipolar versus bipolar or multipolar, and then you could think of a world with like high tension and low tension. And I think the dimension of high tension versus low tension is, is more important because first of all, you want to avoid uh, nuclear war. If you look at you know the number of casualties in great power war, wars like World War One, World War Two versus like lesser wars, um, it's it's like you know an order ma- order of magnitude right. or two difference. And so you want to avoid fighting China. You want to avoid fighting Russia. You want to avoid f- directly fighting them. And like, if if that means maybe you they get like they have more conflicts with their neighbors, those are generally tidy wars. Um, and you know, you know, and so like, the, I mean, the U.S. rules over Latin America. Basically, we arrest. You know, uh, we are we were trying to uh, extradite the president of uh, I think it was Hon- Honduras um, because of you know drug dealing, like a war on drugs. Like we think that gives us the right to like you know, take, <laughs> you know arrest the leaders of other countries. Uh, so like, yeah, but it's not the end of the world. It's not you know I don't think it's good for Latin America. Um, so, uh, yeah, but so that's just, you know, avoiding nuclear war, avoiding great power war, but then like you talk to other people and there's other stuff too. There's, you know, more, ex- more stuff that's closer to existential risk, uh, AGI. I don't know much about it, but smart people are, are very concerned with it. You know, ideally you'd want, somebody was telling me, you know, I was talking to somebody who said, uh, uh, you want a unipolar world because if it's, uh, if it's US and China are close, then like China is going to want to, um, you know, they're going to want to take risks and that might, that might get you AGI. And then I said, 
well, maybe if the U.S. is up here and China is down here, you know, maybe China says, you know, we need that, we need that leap. leap. And, and then right. I, I said, well, what's more important is like whether America and China hate each other rather than one is a lot more powerful uh, than the other. We don't worry about the U.S. and Britain like having a rivalry and that leading to one developed AGI because they're so desperate, right? And, and we need more. We need more. We probably, if this AGI thing is, you know, as true as, as, pe- as important as these people say, we need more than just, you know, not hating each other. We need some kind of probably active uh, cooperation. Now, it's hard to it's hard to compartmentalize the relationship. It's hard to say, well, China, we're going to talk about uh, Hong Kong and we're going to talk about the Uyghurs and we're going to talk about Trump, but like, let's cooperate. on Like, you know, they say China, you know, must have something to hide because they won't let America investigate COVID. And I'm like, are you insane? Like, do you think that like, even if they were the most innocent people in the world, do you think they would like make sense for them to let like America come into their country and like look around and then like, you know, judge them? Like, and then, <laughs> and then, like do you, you think America is seen by them as like a, you know, a, an unbiased source of like, you know, investigate? So, so it's, uh, so, you know, it makes everything else harder. It's hard to compartmentalize. And then you have like things like, well, you know, COVID, things that could be worse than COVID. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the unipolar, you know, I, there's these deterministic theories of international relations theory, like John Mersheim, who I just said was right about Eastern Europe. He has sort of this kind of deterministic theory. The balance of power is fundamental. It'll determine how well we get along or not. We're destined to not get along with China. We don't, we get along with Britain just because they're so weak. I guess if they were strong, you know, we'd, we'd be fighting, you know, the war of 1812 uh, over <laughs> right. again. Um, you know, I, I, I tend not to believe that, you know, I, I don't buy into those theories. Uh, so to me, there's just a lot of good reasons uh, to sort of tamp down the, you know, the, the hostilities in international relations and whether, you know, one country is much, much stronger than the other or not. If the tensions are not high, it doesn't matter nearly as much. And so that's, yeah, that's how I, that's how sort of, that's sort of the outlines of how I see it. Gotcha. So it's something like, maybe we should just like not worry about Taiwan kind of, you know, like that, that's their problem. Uh, you know, kind of let Ukraine like there's problem. We, we should be more biased in that direction than like you know it's our duty to protect Taiwan, Ukraine, etc. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you know, it's I mean, like these are not like uh, Taiwan. The semiconductor thing is a little bit complicated. You know, it's a little bit that people talk about that. I, I I'm not an expert in that, but you know, I, you know, if, like if that's really if we're all we're just depend. But you know, you could I guess if China takes it over, you could buy the semiconductors from China, right? So you're, I mean, you're 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 just uh you're you're uh, dependent on China instead of Taiwan, and maybe you shouldn't be dependent on any one country anyway. You should be finding right. you know, other ways to diversify a little bit, no matter what. Um, yeah, it, it it would be it would be something like that. Um. And, you know, people think that sounds heartless. Now, the Ukraine, I mean, the Ukraine thing, I mean, the Russia aggression in Ukraine did not, you know, start in earnest until 2014, right? It was after the U.S. backed overthrow of the government. So it's like, you know, did things work out? better for Ukraine because of American support. It's very, you know, I think it's very hard to argue that. I think it's hard, you know, it's hard to make these arguments because they're so emotional. It's just like Russia is bad. Ukraine is good. Like, how could we not stand with Ukraine? We should have been standing with Ukraine more. And it's like, no, Ukraine isn't a bad, we did stand with Ukraine. Like we were on Russia's borders, like working on bringing them into, into NATO, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, reforming their government, like, you know, deeply embedded in their government and, you know, not ruling out bringing them into NATO officially. So like we were there and, you know, bad things happened them um so yeah i don't think it worked even worked out for the people of taiwan you know it's, it's in theory you know in theory it could it could be different i mean the china taiwan thing might be different um but in the end you know china versus taiwan a war if, if, if that's all it was it's not an existential risk to, you know, it's not an existential risk to humanity it's not even like a uh, you know, a, you know, a multiple orders of magnitude risk of, you know, death. It, it, these countries probably submit. Actually, if the U.S. is out uh, out of the re, uh, out of the picture, these countries submit the way Latin America, you know, submits to uh, submits to American uh, pressure, which is not the best thing in the world, but not the worst thing in the world. Not a destructive war that kills a lot of people and not, you know, there, there's peace and you know stability. Um, so. Yeah, that, that it would be it would be something like you know my model would you know have something like you know a respect a respect for sort of a uh, 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 like uh, you know um, regions of power. Uh, so um, the, you know which we have with, which we have in Latin America, and which you know it, it's not the end of the world if we give it to a few other countries. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. So kind of give each country some some leeway around themselves. So it's yours. We're not going to mess with it. Um, I, I'm curious. Do you think uh, it's it's possible for us to give like Putin like a de-escalation like off ramp? Is there anything we could do to like ensure to him like, look, we're gonna like we're not gonna do anything. Just like let's all just like calm this down, or is it does it just keep escalating? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I hear people talk about this, it's sort of hard because you're speculating on the psychology of one man right. and his political situation, and yes. it's 
hard to do. Now, all I can do is what anyone else can do is sort of, you know, just look at Putin as a man, look at a situation, look at sort of Russian politics from the outside and sort of just make some, try to make some educated guesses on how they're thinking and sort of what their incentives are. Um, so, you know, I mean, the way I see it, I, I, you know, I think that, the, you know, it's, you know, you could, you could talk about what's politically feasible uh, uh, for the American government to do and like, you know, what could be the ideal situation, right? So, you know, there has, I, you know, I think Russia, I, I don't see a way that they don't, that they pull out without accepting, you know, without, without getting something. Right. Um, this was really bad. Um, this was really bad for them. And, you know, and, and you know, and I think that, you know, they were going to uh, uh, Kiev and I think that, you know, if the, go- if the Ukrainian government collapsed, they would have taken it. I mean, they would have, they, they would have taken that as like plan A, right? That, yeah. that, that, that I see little reason to doubt that. Like, why wouldn't right. you, right? Like that's, that's, uh, uh, that's what, you know, you would do. Sometimes governments do collapse. And a lot of people, like a lot of people, like the American, you know, American analysts didn't think Ukraine would last. Right. Um, so, you know, that was probably, you know, the thing. And then like, now they must have a realization that that's impossible. Um, and so what's plan B? Well, the plan B is, you know, it has to hold on to its gains, I think, which are, you know, Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk. And they don't have all of Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. They have, uh, you know, um, they have most of the populations of these uh, of these two regions. And I think, I think you know, what the, the way they're thinking, and this is sort of stupid because, you know, it objectively doesn't matter. Like if you have the, like they have like the, you know, the, the capital of each uh, place, they have Mariupol, the other large city. Like there's a few other, you know, a few other medium sized cities and towns they can grab, but it doesn't, it doesn't objectively matter. Right. Right. But the, uh, the government, the so-called governments, uh, self-declared governments of these areas, they consider the, these things that the, the old province, uh, the entire province that used to be like united under Ukraine control, they consider that their government. Right. Um, and so I think they feel like they need that. Um, so like, you know, like I just said, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, try to give them that you, right. you could, you could give them that and like declare, you know, like if you, if I could just rewrite American foreign policy, you know, I would just put Putin on like a stamp and like, say he's like the greatest man in history. Like, I think it's like, you could like, you know, you could like psychologically try to satisfy him, right? He's not doing things that are in the objective long-term financial interests of Russia. Right. That's not his right. model. His model is, you know, sort of glory, you know, land, you know, people. Yes, victories. yes, yes. Like very simplified. And it's like, you know, OK, give him this worthless land that doesn't matter. And people are like, yes. oh, that'll, you know, let his appetite hunger for the next thing. Like, no, maybe he'll be satisfied. Like he doesn't have the indication that he's just, you know, he's been in power for 20 years. He hasn't been like Hitler, like knocking, trying to knock off country after yeah. country. Right. There's an indication that he can be satiated. Right. He can be right. appeased. Right. And so, like, you know, you give them these, you know, these areas that don't matter that are going to be hell for Ukraine to get back anyway, if they, if they try. Yes. The Ukraine goal is to get back the stuff that Russia has been occupying since uh, 2014. Um, you know, that, that's going to, that's hard to do if they do do it. I mean, it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, there's a risk of nuclear, I mean, there's a risk of nuclear ex, uh, uh, escalation here. If they, and if they do, it's going to have to be horrific, you know, consequences. They're going to have to do it right. to the Russian occupied cities, what uh, Russia tried to do to the, the Ukrainian cities. Um, and so like, if you can give the, you know, so like, you know, if you can, you know, I think it's hard for Ukraine to take them back anyway, but uh, if you could give some kind of, you know, symbolic glory to Putin and Russia, you know, you could do that. Now, this is the, you know, this is like the best way to, this is like the cheapest, most low cost, like an objective cost, easiest, you know, best way to end the war. It's also literally the hardest thing politically to do, like make Putin feel good about himself, <laughs> like compliment Putin, like say nice things about him. Like this is like literally the Especially hardest now. thing you could do in our politics. Yes. Uh, and so I guess you could sort you could sort of see the dilemmas here. You could see why this is difficult. It's sort of, it's sort of zero sum. I think people think in terms of Russia did a bad thing. Russia has to suffer. Maybe that's right. adaptive at a certain level. Um, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to end a war when you're you're in that headspace, though. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. I, it, it really is. Um, I, I, I'm curious. Bit of a left hand term here, but effective altruists should effective altruists on the margin think more about governance. Um, you know, I'm not. You know, I just. I mean, I read Scott Alexander, but I, I'm not a guy who like reads a lot of effective altruist stuff or knows yeah. a lot of effective altruism people. So, you know, I don't know the balance of how often they think about government. I see, you know, there's the think tank by Alec uh, Stapp and uh, Caleb w- uh, uh, yeah. Watney, Watney or Whitney, what is, is his name? Watney, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there's something going on there. Um, you know, Tyler Cohen, I think, is sort of adjacent to 
effective altruism talks about, you know, state capacity, libertarianism. So as far as I see, there is, there are people thinking of governance. Um, should they, th- you know, should the community as a whole think more or less? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Got it. Got it. Um, Richard, are you down for a round of overrated or underrated? Oh, well, yeah, that, I admit, that would be, that would be really cool actually. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I'll throw out a turn. Just give me uh, um, uh overrated, underrated, properly rated perhaps, and uh, maybe why. Uh-huh. Um, so here we go. The likelihood of a nuclear exchange in the next century, overrated or underrated? Um, I think, you know, I think in the next uh, five years or so, uh, probably underrated. I, uh, we just talked about the difficulties of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and right. I, I try to game out what's going to happen. It, it seems like it's very, very hard. Um, next hundred years, I don't know how, I don't know how to rate that because I don't know what people think i think people think that we're probably i think people tend to think that it's more likely than uh you know it's 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 uh, somewhat at least somewhat likely and you know my 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 uh, my uh you know 100 years do people even think in terms of 100 years i don't know but you know i think there before the russian ukraine war i you know i had reasons for i was a little bit more optimistic about this in the sense that i thought there's probably less than a you know less of a chance of this happening in the next you know 50 100 years than a lot of smart people um because i think you know we i you know it just seems like there's a you know there's just such a discrepancy uh between like what these weapons can do and what countries you know, can necessarily, are necessarily fighting over. Like you look at like the actual, like Taiwan ma- like matters. I mean, it's, it has like the, you know, the semiconductors at least. Yeah. Every other conflict in the world is just like worthless land. It doesn't, <laughs> right. it doesn't, I mean, there's oil, you know, there's oil, I guess in the middle East, but you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, you know, oil is not like, uh, you know, it's not like the center of the global economy now. But the biggest countries aren't, you know, the wealthiest because of because of rent, uh, natural resource rents. And so, like, you know, there's there's a kind of thing where, like, it's like the smarter countries are are in charge. There's sort of a Dar- Darwinian process where, like, you know, America and China are not, you know, run by like the craziest, uh, literally the craziest people in the world. Um, and so, you know, I think if we get past this Russia Ukraine thing, you know, I probably. Um, we, we, you know, I think smart people probably overrate uh, the chances of a nuclear war in the next hundred years. Gotcha. Do you, do you think uh, the the Russians are just more more um, willing to use like tactical uh, weapons of this type than than we are? Perhaps I don't know if they're more willing than we are. I think there's situ- the situation that they're in back in a corner kind of thing. Like if we were like if we had you know we have to like analogize situation. If we had like a power supporting Mexico and like they were right. shelling like parts of the U.S. and like they wanted to like you know, yeah. potentially yeah potentially bring you know them into their uh, bring uh, Mexico into their defensive alliance. Like would we be more or less or likely than Russia? Like like who knows? But we're not in that situation, right? right. Russia is in that situation. If the war goes poorly and they you know their their conventional advantage is you know not all that people thought it was and you know they end up maybe in a worse position than when they started the war like worse in the terms of just like less land they'll be worse in like terms of like like so they're just thinking simplistically in terms of land and you know to be more a little more charitable protecting the russian speakers and uh in eastern ukraine um you know if it comes down that they're in a worse position after all of this um yeah i, I think the nuclear option could look you know more uh more uh you know it could be you could see the temptation there certainly makes sense um left-wing bias in academia overrated or underrated uh, it's probably underrated as a force, but overrated in its uh, real world importance. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, very biased. I mean, the, the people still like, you know, unironically share these charts of like democracy is going like this when Republicans are in office and it's going like this. When, I mean, it just doesn't, and you look at the things, and the, you know, the, 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 they just, you know, they're often just surveys of academics. The experts think that the Republicans hate democracy. It's like, you know, you don't have to be a genius to see this is like, this is sort of stupid. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's, and that's not like, and when people think about academic you know, bias, they think of like space, safe spaces, microaggressions, like these, you know, objectively ridiculous, you know, these clearly uh, transparently ridiculous things. They don't think as much in terms of just like okay they're making charts and graphs and doing like seemingly sophisticated looking statistics that are just like them like regressing their opinions on like you know other people's opinions i mean it really is just like the, the research projects is just are often very stupid um so it's it's probably underrated um the extent to which the bias is there it's overrated because we treat it like the most important thing in the world so one of my focuses in 
it's a civil rights law. Now, government has suppressed free speech in the workplace for a very, very long time. Um, the harassment law, basically, there, there's no there's no clarity. Basically, you know, if you say something that someone can interpret racist and sexist, your boss can be in a lot of trouble. Your boss, therefore, has an HR department to make sure that you don't say anything that can violate, you know, so, uh, so-called civil rights. You know, th- th- this you know this has been American work life for the last uh, you know whatever. But you know, corporate mid-level corporate executives do not write op-eds in the New York Times and have right. substacks and stuff. They're just going to work and trying to live, right? While the people who you know write about you know public events you know, make, you know, shape our narrative, our people on university campuses are like, oh my God, wait, I can't say these things I used to say. It becomes the biggest thing in the world, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that, I think that, you know, the, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, repression of speech in a lot of different ways uh, in this country. And, um, you know, in academics, you know, it, it, I, I just don't think, you know, it, it's not, um, it's not, spe- it's not special. It's getting a little, it's getting more extreme, certainly. Uh, how much do academics matter? If you've ever like looked at a, uh, you know, if you ever like know a policy area, well, you know, like the academic literature and how academics think about it versus like the people at think tanks or the people closer to policy, you see there's often a very wide discrepancy. Like the the idea that uh, Russia, um, you know, that the U.S. NATO expansion, uh, you know, provoked provoked Russia uh, into this conflict is a is a very mainstream view in IR, or at least it was like until the Russian. Maybe they've been caught up in like the politics of the you know the emotions, right, of it. Right. but it was a mainstream view, you know, until whatever a couple months ago, um, and then you know. Um, not really a main, mainstream view of sad Capitol Hill. There was a headline um, like uh, in the Washington Post, that Rand Paul like blames, you know, uh, you know, blames NATO expansion for like, you know, it's like, and then like he was contradicted by experts. Like and they put that in there. You know, they always say that like when they when they don't like what someone is saying. Um, and so yeah, it, you know, the, the academics, you know, they 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 think NATO matters, but they like in a lot of places they don't matter um, as much as they as they often think. <laughs> that's that's really good. That's really good. Um, Chinese state capacity is it overrated or underrated? Oh, it's um, it's it's underrated. I mean the the COVID that like they, I think they're crazy to still be on zero COVID, but the zero COVID lasted this long is is incredible. And you know That's maybe impressive. maybe they were maybe they were um, you know maybe they were exaggerating the numbers, but look, I mean people were pretty early in the pandemic. You know the corporations were opening up, people were walking, journalists were walking around China. They were saying, and it's not like they're chill about COVID. Like if there were outbreaks. Like I don't think they would be letting Western journalists, you know, walk around and life get back to normal. They were, they were getting back. Now maybe they're too, you know, crazy about COVID. So you know, there's a question of like wise decision making uh, versus the capacity to do stuff. Um, the capacity to do stuff seems very, very impressive. And then you look at like you know the the infrastructure building. I think there was a quote, there was a um, uh, statistic from like Bill Gates. I think it was about ten years ago, but he said something like, you know, in three years China used more cement than the U.S. used in the last hundred or something like that. Um, and so and. And there was actually I saw some like uh, some like fact checker that quotes like you know they they're for some cultural or whatever reason are more likely to use cement in building buildings than we are okay okay so it's not a perfect it's not a perfect comparison uh, but you know anyway you look at it I mean the 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 you know the building capacity uh, of the the ability to build infrastructure you know high quality infrastructure. Uh, like even science like you know the high high quality you know the number of patents thing uh, things like that which is probably more people capacity than than state capacity but i think in a wide very variety of measures i mean it's impressive the hong kong i mean the hong kong and the Uyghur thing i mean people don't like to think about this as a matter of state capacity um but you know they had terrorist attacks in xinjiang um they had uh you know they had a huge protest movement in hong kong that had a substantial portion of the public um uh coming out and 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 they put it down i mean they solved the problem i mean whatever you think morally so that has to count as for something as far as state capacity Definitely, definitely. Yes, it, it, it's very impressive. Um, well, Richard, I, I have I have one class question for you, and this is for my own curiosity. Um, how would you describe yourself politically if you had to like label your, label yourself? Where do you think you come down? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm pretty much. I, I guess I could say I get good breaking down. I mean, I'm pro market. Uh, I'm anti-interventionist. Maybe even sort of like liberal international cooperative. Uh, cooperative on. Uh, uh, foreign policy stuff. I'm sort of a reactionary in my cultural sort of sensibilities. Um, and then I, you know, I, I, it usually manifests itself in liber- you know, libertarianism as far as state policy goes, but, you know, uh, you know, sometimes my, my, uh, my, um, aesthetic preferences will, will overcome the libertarian instincts. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess I'm a non I mean, a non-interventionist conservative is probably, you know, you know, an, an anti-war for, you know, conservative, Maybe libertarian, I guess, is probably you know the closest as far as uh, you know normal categories people think of. Got it, got it. I love that. I love that. Well, Richard, um, 
thank you so much for taking the time to come on um, the podcast. Where can we find you? Where should we send people? Uh, so just my um, Twitter and my Substack. So it's very, uh, I started them like not thinking about branding myself, just thinking about, you know, me saying things. So it's Richard Hanania at dot substack.com. And then Richard, my name is just Richard Hanania on Twitter. And you can follow along there. Oh, by the way, I have a podcast, the CSPI podcast. Um, I have a, a CS, there's a CSPI uh, mailing list, which is also at Substack. So people should check this out. A lot of great stuff there. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives. 